This video covers two important clades of pan crustaceans, copepods and thecostrachans, like this pulsing externa of this root-headed barnacle emerging from a porcelain crab. We'll use this simple phylogeny to organize arthropods, with chelicerates being sister to a clade composed of myriapods and pancrustaceans. There are many distinct groups in pancrustacea, but this video covers only two. Copepods and thecostrachans may be very close relatives of each other, but that's not certain. Let's start with copepods. These are especially abundant and ecologically important in the plankton, where they are easy to collect with a net. The fast organisms zigzagging through this concentrated plankton are mostly copepods. To get a closer look, one has to pick them out with a pipette and constrain them under a cover slip. Here's a calanoid copepod in ventral view. It's moving in bursts using escape swimming, using the long first antennae, and also using some thoracic appendages, which we can't really see. The first antennae have lots of long sensory bristles, or CD. You can see that this animal has a single median noplier eye. The next pairs of appendages behind the first antennae are the short second antennae, then the mandibles, and two pairs of maxillae like in other crustaceans. There are also a few pairs of thoracic appendages. It's hard to distinguish most appendages behind the mandibles though without dissecting them out. The abdomen is short and does not have any appendages. You can also see this animal's digestive system running through the body. Here's another calanoid, this one in dorsal view, making it more difficult to see the head and thoracic appendages. One first antenna is broken. Again, you can clearly see the single median eye. This is another planktonic copepod, starting off swimming with its second antennae, but then doing an escape jump with its first antennae and thoracic appendages. I also found lots of copepod nopleus larvae in the plankton. Many copepods also live on the sea floor. I looked for one specific kind inside the shells of intertidal hermit crabs, Pagurus samuelis. To do that, I had to crack open shells and look at the shell fragments. The first copepod I found was not the one I was looking for, but it's lovely and I filmed it anyway. You can see two pairs of antennae at the anterior end, long first antennae and short second antennae. The digestive system is particularly obvious in this animal. This female is brooding eggs in a sac held beneath the abdomen.
And here's the copepod I was actually looking for, one that may only live with hermit crabs, I'm not sure. Certainly the only place I know where to find it. Here are two individuals on a fragment of snail shell formerly occupied by a hermit crab. And here's a probable male at higher magnification. Most appendages are obscured by the body since we're looking at this from the dorsal side. Here's a male-female pair. The large male is grasping the female with his first antennae. He's probably waiting for her to undergo her final molt into maturity, then he'll mate with her. You can see the single noplier eye in each individual, and in the female the digestive system is visible too, filled with yellowish material. Now Thecostrachans, and in particular one group, cirripedes or barnacles. You're all familiar with barnacles since they're so common in the inner title and subtitle. I collected acorn barnacles from pilings at a dock at the mouth of Alamitos Bay. You can identify the shell plates on clean individuals, like the large one in the center, anterior is to the left on this individual. When I placed these back into seawater, the first thing most of them did was to partly emerge from their shells. They're flushing the mantle cavity with clean seawater. This is called respiratory pumping. They're not extending the thoracic feeding appendages, the cirri, to capture particles, though. But soon some did. Here's one feeding viewed from the posterior. You can see four pairs of biramus cirri being extended. These are used to capture diatoms and other particles from the seawater. Those are then brought to the mouth by the first two thoracic appendages, the maxillipeds, which we can't see here. If there's a water current passing over them, they often just hold out the Siri and allow the current to carry particles to them. I was generating a water current here with a pipette. You can see that the net of Siri can change orientation depending on where that current is coming from. A few individuals even extended their penis, although not to its full extent.
you can see that the tip of the penis has lots of sensory kitty on it. and some individuals molted. The calcareous shell is permanent, but barnacles have to molt the cuticle just like any other arthropod. I picked up a molt and mounted it on a slide. You can clearly see four pairs of biramus cirri, and anterior to those to the left, two pairs of maxillipeds. Extending to the top right is the cuticle of the penis, and to the left is the thin cuticle that covered the rest of the body. Here's a higher magnification view. The cirri have lots of CD, which are used to help capture food. The maxillipeds are even more cetose. Those are used to help move food anteriorly to the mouth parts. Here's another common Southern California acorn barnacle, this one found in more wave-exposed habitats. A goose barnacle, Polycipes polymerus, is also common in wave-exposed habitats. It's often found in association with the mussel Middleus californianus. Anterior is to the right for all three of these individuals. There are lots of shell plates in these animals, but you can still pick out the rostrum, scoodle and turgle plates, and the carina. Here they are. Rostrum, scutum, turgum, carina. From a different perspective, the rostrum, the two scoodle plates, the two turgle plates, and the carina. To see the rest of the body, one needs to open up the barnacle. Here it is pinned out with anterior to the left.
The most obvious parts here are the Siri. Polysipes has five pairs of Biramus Siri. The first pair of thoracic appendages are maxillopeds. Tucked into those five pairs of Siri is the penis. The penis is attached right above the anus, which you can see here. Barnacles really don't have much of an abdomen at all. Here are those thoracic appendages, cirrus 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and the maxilliped. So a total of six pairs of thoracic appendages. And here's another view of the penis. To see how those are arranged more clearly, it helps to remove one appendage of each pair. Here I've cut off all six of the right thoracic appendages. You can see how the penis is held when it's not being used. Here are those six thoracic appendages. On the far left, the maxilliped, then five feeding cirri. That's a total of six thoracic appendages on each side of the body. To see the mouth parts, one needs to orient the animal differently. Here I've pinned it out so we're basically looking ventrally. The labrum and the mouth parts look kind of like a bulldog face or the face of a bat. The forehead of that bat is the labrum. The lower jaw of the bat are the mouth parts. Here I'm pointing to the mouth parts with the left forceps. Here's the right maxilla 2, the right maxilla 1, and the right mandible. The mandibles have a few pointy teeth that are kind of yellow gold in color. The other bits and pieces you see, what looks like the bat's ears and eyes, for example, are epipodites of those mouth parts. The first polysipes I dissected was not reproductive, so I dissected another to look for brood masses. Barnacles brood their offspring in their mantle cavity and release them as nauplii. In polysipes, the brood masses are peach colored and are called lamellae. Each brooding individual has two. Here are the two lamellae from that barnacle. They're basically just embryos glued together in two sheets.
At higher magnification, you can see that these are fairly early embryos. There's a tissue layer on the outside of each and some large cells on the inside. So I think these have undergone gastrulation, but they're not far beyond that. Eventually those embryos will get released as Nauplius larvae, like this one I collected from the plankton. I think this is an acorn barnacle Nauplius. After several molts, Noplii metamorphose into non-feeding cyprid larvae. The cyprid really only does one thing, which is to look for a good place to settle and metamorphose. Here are some cyprids I collected from the plankton doing just that. This individual is using its first antennae to taste the substratum. It's sort of snuffling along, trying to determine if this is a good place to metamorphose. They can swim using their thoracic appendages as well. Here's another cyprid doing the same thing, but while covered in a bunch of schmutz. I collected a few porcelain crabs to look at one more barnacle which parasitizes this crab here in Southern California. These two crabs both look quite normal, but one is in fact a crab zombie. It has a barnacle parasite that has taken over the crab body and won't let the crab reproduce anymore. The parasite is internal, but when it reproduces, it makes an external brood chamber called an externa. The externa hangs out of the crab under the abdomen where the crab would normally carry its own eggs if it were a reproductive female. This crab does not have an externa, so it might not be parasitized. But this crab is carrying an externa, so it's certainly parasitized. This pulsing object is the barnacle brood chamber, or externa. It's completely full of barnacle embryos. When I tilt it down, you can see that there's a hole in the center of the externa. When the externa contracts, it ejects water out of that hole. When it swells up, it refills with water through that hole. That helps to provide oxygen for the developing embryos. And when the embryos reach the Nauplius stage, they are released to the outside via that hole. The external pulses even after being torn from the host. The barnacle parts inside the host crab don't look anything like a barnacle. They look more like a fungal mycelium. I couldn't visualize them clearly and so I'm not showing them in this video.
The embryos in this externa each have a noplier eye, so are probably very close to release. I removed a few from the externa, and indeed they are perfectly good barnacle noplii. These will eventually become cyprids that will settle either on an unparasitized crab or on the externa of a female rhizocephalon already in a crab.